Hello again and welcome back to Psychology with Mr. Snyder. And today we're going to talk about Chapter 2, Section 3, about how we observe and test in psychology. Here are your learning targets. We're going to go through, list, and describe the different methods of observation and then how we're going to talk about how researchers analyze those observations. But first, let's go over these methods of observation. This one you're probably familiar with, the testing method. This is just paper and pencil type tests or a Rorschach test, which you can see there in the cartoon. Um, the inkblot test known as that. But um, the testing method can include intelligence tests like an IQ test, an aptitude test to see how well a person would do in a particular thing or field, and a personality test to try to identify certain uh, things that can go wrong in a person's personality. A case study is when one individual or group is studied in great detail. We try to learn everything they can about that individual in a case study. So the advantage of the case study is that a tremendous amount of detail can be gotten from the subject. Um, it may also be the certain it may also be one way to get certain types of information. For example, one case study that we're going to talk about in here is Phineas Gage. He had, he, in the 1800s, he had a large metal rod driven through his head from an uh, explosion at a railroad, and he suffered a major personality change as a result because the, re the pipe went straight through his skull, and researchers can't study that with something we're going to talk about with naturalistic observation. An experiment is out of the question. It's unethical, so sometimes it's the only way to get certain types of information. The disadvantage of a case study is that researchers can't apply the results to other people. So we can't assume that if one, it, if one person had the same kinds of experiences growing up that he or she would turn out just like the person in the case study. They have too many complicating factors in their lives to be that predictable. So, we're, so what researchers find in one case won't necessarily apply or generalize to others. Another weakness of case studies is that they are a form of detailed observation and they're vulnerable to bias, just like other ones. In the longitudinal method, these are opposites, pretty much. A longitudinal method is just studying a group of people for a long period of time. Um, selecting a group of, of participants and then following those participants over years or even decades. Uh, advantages are that it's very, very accurate because you are following the same people that remain in the study. Of course, some people die, some people move away, but you still have a core group of people. Uh, disadvantages are, obviously, it takes a long time to observe how people change over time, and it is very expensive as well to um, and garnering uh, funding for an experiment like that might be rather difficult. So instead, we look at the cross-sectional method. The cross-sectional method is if we want to study a group of people over 20 years, we will select a group of people at the age of 5, and then at the another group of people who are at the age of 10, and another group of people that are at the age of 15, another group of people that are at age 20, and so on, until we get a sample that includes people of different ages, and we can look at the differences between them. Um, the disadvantages of the longitudinal method are actually the advantages of the cross-sectional method because um, it's cheap, it doesn't take a long time, it's rather easy, but it doesn't provide a lot of detail because the differences between the groups of people who are different ages could be due to the fact that they're just different people. You know, depending on what you're studying, we can't be sure or not whether or not it will um, conclude with them finding any research. So the detail is lacking in a cross-sectional method. Now, psychologists, when they observe children as they're learning language naturally or how people behave in a certain situation, they're using naturalistic observation. And that is the best way to view about how people or animals behave, is to watch them behave in their normal environment. So researchers in studying people might want to look at people in their workplaces, at their homes, 
uh, playgrounds, restaurants, malls, public areas, how do they interact with one another? The advantage is that it gets a realistic picture of how behavior occurs because they're actually watching that behavior. But we also need to take precautions because in many cases, animals or people who know they are being watched will not behave normally anyway. And that is called the observer effect. So the observer needs to remain hidden from view. And that's a difficult thing to do when you're researching humans. If a researcher was at a mall, they may wear uh, glasses to hide their eye movement. They may pretend they're reading a book, but that way they're able to observe people's natural behavior at the mall and they don't know they're being watched. Other people use one-way mirrors or they might actually become participants in a group, a technique called participant observation. Um, and the people who are in on it, in on a part of the group, are called confederates. Are there disadvantages? Yeah, the observer bias. That happens when the person doing the observing has a particular opinion about what he or she is going to see or expects to see. If that is the case, sometimes that person sees only those actions that support that expectation and ignores actions that don't fit. And you can get around that by using blind observers. If I give the research question, or I'm sorry, if I don't tell the research question to other people and they don't have any preconceived notions about what they should see, they're going to write down everything they see and then the researcher can analyze the data. But sometimes observing people or animals is not practical in a natural setting. For example, we might want to observe the reactions of infants to a mirror image of themselves and then record those reactions with a camera set up behind the mirror. You can't do that in a natural setting. So if we bring the infants into the laboratory, we would be able to bring the infant to the equipment, control the number of infants, control their ages, and control everything else that goes on in the laboratory. And it obviously has a disadvantage of being an artificial situation that might result in artificial behavior from the people. Um, both animals and people react differently in labs than they would in the real world. Um, the main advantage is it gives a good con uh, degree of control. Uh, the Skinner box is a box three sides of wood or solid material and the fourth of glass so that we can observe what goes on. You can put babies in Skinner boxes, rats, whatever you want to observe. So here are some reviews of the testing method and the case study method. The longitudinal method and the cross-sectional method. And the naturalistic method and the laboratory methods of observation. And if you want to pause any of those and write down the advantages and disadvantages, feel free to. Now, how do we analyze these observations? So we do that by interpreting observations through correlations. And correlations is a measure of how the relationship between two or more variables is. And a variable is anything that can change or vary, like scores on a test, temperature in a room, gender, and many other things. So for example, researchers might be curious to know whether or not cigarette smoking is connected to life expectancy or the number of years a person can be expected to live. Obviously, the scientists can't hang around people who smoke and wait to see when those people die. The only way to find out if smoking behavior and life expectancy are related to each other is to use the medical records of people who have already died. So researchers would look for two facts from each record, the number of cigarettes the person smoked per day and the age of the death of the person. We have something called the correlation coefficient. And the correlation coefficient represents two things, the direction of the relationship and its strength. Are the number of cigarettes a person smoked each day and the age of their death related. Whenever researchers talk about two variables being related, what they really mean is that knowing the value of one variable allows them to predict the value of the other variable. So for example, if researchers found that smoking and life expectancy are related, they should be able to predict how long someone might live if they know how many cigarettes a person smoked. But which way does it go? If a person smokes a lot of cigarettes, does that mean that he or she will live a longer life or a shorter one? 
Does life expectancy go up or down as smoking increases? That's what's meant by the direction of the relationship. And you can see here in the graphic that in terms of the correlation coefficient, the number researchers get from the formula will either be a positive number or a negative number. And we're not going to go into the actual statistics, but you do need to know about the directions and the strength. If it's positive, the two variables increase in the same direction. As one goes up, the other goes up. As one decreases, the other decreases. If negative, the two variables have an inverse relationship. As one increases, the other decreases. If researchers found that the more cigarettes a person smoked, the younger that person was when he or she died, what would that be? It would be a negative relationship. As smoking goes up, represented here by Y, then the age goes down. Now let's talk about the strength of the relationship. So you can see here a perfect positive correlation, very strong. This is a modest correlation, we can see. And then absolutely no relationship or correlation here. The number, which is represented in studies that we're going to look at, is represented by the small letter R, will always range between plus 1 and negative 1. The reason is that it cannot be greater than 1 or less than 1 it has to do with the formula and the imaginary line on the graph around which the data points gather called a scatter plot, and we're not going to talk about that. But if the relationship is a strong one, the number will be closer to 1 or closer to negative 1. A correlation of plus 0.89, for example, would be a very strong positive correlation. A correlation of negative 0.89 would be equally strong, but negative. Notice that the closer the number is to zero, the weaker the relationship becomes. Researchers would probably find that the correlation coefficient for the relationship between people's weight and the number of freckles they have is pretty close to zero. So let's go back to the cigarette thing. If we found that the correlation between cigarette smoking and life expectancy was high, does that mean that smoking causes your life expectancy to be shortened? Not exactly. The biggest error is that people believe that correlation means that A causes B, and that is not true. Correlation does not reveal cause and effect. Just because A and B are related does not mean that A causes B. For example, suppose that all of the students in the school band, only the tuba players, get good grades. Did they get good grades because they were tuba players? Or were there other causes? Perhaps the, t the tuba players have to get good grades to stay in the band. You know, people at hospitals are usually sick. Does that mean that going to the hospital causes you to be sick? No, it does not. We know that from experience, but that is the limit of a correlation. It does not reveal cause and effect. They could both be related to some other variable that is the cause of both. For example, the cigarette smoking thing. Cigarette smoking and life expectancy could be linked only because people who smoke may be less likely to take care of their health by eating right and exercising. Whereas people who don't smoke may tend to eat healthier foods and exercise more than smokers do. To sum it up, a correlation will tell researchers if there is a relationship between the variables, how strong the relationship is, and in what direction the relationship goes. And that is the end of today.